Hello and welcome to the Consist of the Kark YouTube channel. I'm your host of this video, Reverend Jake Zabel, the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia. On today's video, we're going to continue my lecture series on what it means to be a Lutheran by wrapping up our lecture series on the Apostles' Creed by discussing the traditional 12th article of the Apostles' Creed, The Life Everlasting. At the return of Christ, all the dead shall be raised bodily from the grave and those who are left alive will be caught up into heaven to stand before the judgment throne. In Matthew 24, 40-41, it says that first the wicked will be taken away, and the righteous will be left to be called up into the air. We know that it is the wicked and not the righteous who will be taken away, because in Matthew 24, 38-39, Jesus says that it will be like in the days of Noah, when the flood swept away all the wicked, so it will be in, so in the same way the rapture will sweep away all the wicked. Also in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, from Matthew 13, it says that the weeds are gathered up first and burned in the fire, while the wheat is gathered up second and taken into the barn. Then both the living and the dead shall stand before the judgment throne to be judged. The unbelievers shall march to the left of Christ into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels, while the believers will dance to the right of Christ into the eternal kingdom of the new heavens and the new earth. For thus it shall be at the return of Christ. All the dead will be raised, and all the living will be changed, but not all shall be saved. In Daniel 12, 2, it tells us that on the last day those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some will go to everlasting life, and some will go to shame and everlasting contempt. In Revelation 20 verses 13 to 14, it tells us that death and hell shall give up their dead, and they shall be judged. They will be hurled into the lake of fire, which is the second death, where they shall suffer for eternity. Matthew 13.30 tells us that those left living on the earth who do not believe will be harvested like weeds and cast into the fire. As Revelation 20.15 says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he shall be thrown into the lake of fire. This is the fate of all unbelievers, those who do not repent of their sins, those who do not believe in Christ Jesus as their God, Lord and Saviour, who have rejected God's grace and forgiveness, and who have sought to live in their sins. This is the sad and fearful reality for all who deny Christ. But I have some good news for all of you who do believe in Christ as your God, your Lord and your Saviour. For all of you who do repent of your sins, who do desire forgiveness and freedom from sin, who strive after holiness, who cling to Christ in faith and have been baptised in the name of the Trinity, to you I have good news. For the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.14, that all who have fallen asleep in Christ shall be raised from the dead. And in verse 17 it states that all the believers who are left on earth, they shall be caught up into the air along with the resurrected, to meet Christ in the air. Matthew 13.30 states that all the believers who are left on earth shall be harvested like wheat and carried into the barn. As Revelation 21.27 states, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, they shall enter into the new Jerusalem, which is the new heavens and the new earth. Hebrews 12, 26-28 quotes Haggai 2, 6. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The author of Hebrew, by the power of the Holy Spirit, interprets the phrase yet once more to mean that God will remove the heavens and earth that can be shaken, and he will replace them which heavens and earth that cannot be shaken. In verse 28, the author states that we shall give thanks to God, since we shall receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Here the author of Hebrews states that God will remove the old heavens and the old earth and replace them with something new, something unshakable. Revelations 21 1 states that there will be a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. In 2 Peter 3 verses 10 to 13 it tells us that on the day of the Lord the heavens and the earth shall be burnt up and dissolved 
but that they will be replaced by a new heavens and a new earth. Now, the Orthodox Lutheran Fathers debated over whether these new heavens and new earth would be an entirely new creation made out of nothing, or whether they would be recreated from the old heavens and the old earth. The scriptures are not clear on this point, and the Lutheran theologians could not agree. Some argued that just as our resurrected bodies are created from our former bodies, so shall the new heavens and the new earth be recreated out of the old heavens and the old earth. While other theologians argued that since 2 Peter 3, 10 to 11 said that the old heavens and the old earth are burnt up and dissolved, and since Isaiah 65, 17 said that the former heavens and earth shall not be remembered or come to mind, it would appear that the first heavens and the first earth are completely erased from existence and that the new heavens and the new earth are created out of nothing, just as God did in the beginning with the first creation. What we do know is that after the judging of the living and the dead, the old heavens and the old earth will pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth that the believers shall dwell in with God for eternity. Isaiah 65 verses 17 to 25 speaks of what it will be like in the new heavens and the new earth. We will be glad and rejoice forever. There will be no sound of weeping or crying of distress. There will be no death. The infant shall not die, nor will the old man fail to fill out his days. One hundred, one hundred years old will seem like a young man, for we shall live for an eternity. Even a man of a thousand years would seem as yet would seem as young as an infant. We shall build houses and we shall live in them, plant vineyards and and we shall plant vineyards and eat of our own fruit. Our labors will never be in vain. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Dust shall be the serpent's food. Here Isaiah is speaking of Satan being cast out and defeated. Isaiah then ends this section by saying that none shall hurt or destroy in God's holy mountain. And in Isaiah 11, 6-9, which also alludes to the new heavens and the new earth, verse 9 begins that being the exact same as Isaiah 65, 25, here Isaiah gives the same picture of animals being at peace. Isaiah speaks of the wolf dwelling with the lamb, the leopard lying down with the young goat, the calf and the lion playing together being led by the young child, the cow and the bear grazing together, the lion eating straw like an ox, the infant playing over the cobra's hole and the toddler putting his hand into the adder's den. In Isaiah 66, verses 19 to 24, it speaks of God gathering people from all nations on his holy mountain, and that they shall come to him on horses, in chariots and wagons, on mules and camels. And the Lord will select some of them and appoint them as priests, for in the new heavens and the new earth the people of God will come and worship before him from Sabbath to Sabbath, from new moon to new moon. That is, at least once every week and at the start of each month. Verse 24 gives a strange reference to the people of God going out and looking on the dead bodies of the unbelievers, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. This last verse suggests that the believers in the new heavens and the new earth will be able to go somewhere and to see afar the eternal lake of fire where they shall see the unbelievers suffering, that we shall be able to look upon the unbelievers as they suffer. But we will not grieve or feel sorry for them, for we will have the mind of Christ and we will know that this is a just punishment which they deserve and from which they will never be spared. Now much of these prophecies from Isaiah are using symbolic language and cannot be taken literally. For example, Isaiah 65 speaks of people dying at age 100 being called young, and it speaks of us bearing children. Yet we know that there will be no death in the new heavens and the new earth. And Jesus tells us in the gospel that we shall not marry nor have children in the new heavens and the new earth. Here, Isaiah is not literally talking about death and birth, but alluding to the unending nature of eternity. 
Isaiah 11 also speaks of an infant and toddler playing with snakes. But since everyone in the new heavens and the new earth will have a perfect body, it is most likely that we will all be adults at our peak age and that there will be no infants or toddlers in the new heavens and the new earth. This language from Isaiah is to reflect the peace and the tranquility of the new heavens and the new earth. And in Isaiah 65 it speaks of people building houses and planting vineyards. This is to allude to the fact that everyone will have something somewhere to live and that we shall produce food. But this work will not be for survival, but instead this work of producing food will be done for joy and out of service to the Lord. Now, it is likely that the mention of animals living in peace and eating grass and hay together is true, and that there shall be animals in the new heavens and the new earth all herbivores, just as it was during the creation week, see Genesis 1.30. Hosea 2.18 mentions that on the day of the Lord God would make a covenant with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. And in Revelation 5.13 it states that every creature in heaven, that is the sky, on earth, under the earth, and in the sea will join in singing praise to God. From all this, we can assume that in the new heavens and the new earth, it will be like the original heavens and earth before the fall, when man and animal lived in peace on earth, and man worked the garden and kept the garden, and everything ate, and everything ate fruit and vegetables, and that every one and everything rested on the Sabbath. So it shall be in the new heavens and the new earth. People from all nations, tribes and tongues will live together in peace and harmony alongside the, animal, the animals. We shall build houses to live in and plant vineyards and orchards to produce our food, giving us the joy of work, the way God originally intended it. And on the Sabbath and the new moon, we shall rest from our labor and we shall gather together on God's holy mountain and in the new Jerusalem to worship God. And at Isaiah 66, 21 says, God shall appoint, their, shall appoint for us priests, possibly the 24 elders mentioned in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, 1 through 22, 5 also speaks of the new heavens and the new earth. Verse 1 mentions that there will be no sea, although since the new creation contains the seas, contains the sea creatures, and since Revelation 5, 19 alludes to creatures Sorry. Verse 1 mentions that there will be no sea. However, since the first creation did contain the sea, and since Revelation 5.19 alludes to the creatures of the seas praising God, it is likely that the phrase, no more sea, is not speaking about a literal sea, but is employing symbolic language. In the scriptures, sea, the sea is often used as a symbol of chaos and destruction. Thus, it is possible that when Revelation 21.1 says there will be no more sea, it does not list, literally mean that there won't be any water, but that there will be no chaos and destruction. Revelation 21 goes on to speak of the new Jerusalem, which will have no temple, for the Trinity will be our temple. And there will be no sun or moon in the new Jerusalem, for the glory of God will be our light. And there will only ever be day and never night. Instead, we can come and worship God whenever we so desire. Exactly what the new heavens and the new earth looks like, we cannot know for sure this side of eternity. Especially since the scriptures often employ symbolic language when discussing the new heavens and the new earth. One thing we do know is that we will live forever. Revelation 22 verse 5 states that the Christian will reign with God forever and ever. In Matthew 25 46 it says that the Christian shall enter into everlasting life. And Isaiah 66 22 teaches that the new heavens and the new earth shall remain forever. This is the most amazing gift of God, that we shall live in his presence, in heavenly bliss, with no tears or death or suffering, with joy and gladness forever without end. St. Paul wrote in Romans 8.18, 8, 
I do not consider the sufferings of this present age worthy of comparison with the glory that shall be revealed towards us. Paul was not fazed by the sufferings of this life because he knew that no matter how bad this life was, it was not worth comparing with the life to come. And this comes from the man who was whipped multiple times, beaten on a number of occasions and nearly stoned to death. All this suffering Paul considered as nothing when he considered the life everlasting. Eternity is something that is hard to imagine. Our life on earth is but a dash between two dates, from conception to death. Psalm 90 verse 10 states that man's lifespan is 70 years, possibly a hundred, if possibly Psalm 90 verse 10 says that man's lifespan is 70, possibly 80 if strong. Some people even manage to live to 100. Methuselah managed to live to be 969 years old. But even a thousand years is minuscule when you compare it to eternity. No matter how much suffering we go through this life, it is nothing when we compare it with eternal bliss. Consider a pinprick that lasts but a second. It is a mo in that moment it hurts, yet it is quickly forgotten. What is this one pinprick when you compare it with the years of your life when you are not pricked by that pin? This is how Paul viewed earthly suffering in eternal life. Even if you manage to live 100 years, and even if every second of that life was filled with unbearable pain and suffering, it would still be but a pinprick when you consider what you will live through with eternal bliss. Just the mere fact that the new heavens and the new earth are without pain and suffering is already amazing in itself. But this amazement is multiplied endlessly when we consider the fact that this bliss is for eternity. Just as the pinprick hurts for the moment but is quickly forgotten, so too when you get to the afterlife, the suffering of this life will soon be forgotten. It will be but a speck in your memory. Therefore, let us think like St. Paul. Let us not consider the sufferings of this present age, but rejoice in the eternal bliss that awaits us. Let us rejoice and be glad and give thanks to God for our home that is waiting for us. Amen. And that wraps up our lecture series on the Apostles' Creed. Join us again in our next video where we continue our What It Means to Be a Lutheran lecture series by starting to look at the Lord's Prayer. I've been your host, Reverend Jake Zabel. Goodbye and God bless.